Welcome everybody to this seminar uh, that we have today. Um, it's the third seminar in, in the row here of this uh, super airy uh, webinar on climate policy. It's uh, from the Center for Economic Policy Research and jointly with the um, European Association of um, Environment and Resource Economists. It's the third seminar in the row uh, on the European Green Deal. And today it's uh, with a special focus on the Fit for 55 package that was presented by the European Commission on Wednesday. And um, Ursula von der Leyen called the EU Green Deal the man on the moon moment. And to stay within the metaphor, you could say that this Fit for 55 package is the rocket that just should take us there. And uh, in the course of this webinar, we will see whether it really delivers uh, what we need to, to go to the moon. And I'm very happy that we have uh, very distinguished uh, speakers today who will introduce the package and also discuss it. Um, and the foremost aim of this seminar is to get a better understanding of this very huge package that we have of all the different facets and how they interlink and uh, what are the critical issues. My name is uh, Brigitte Knopf. I will be moderating the discussion. I am Secretary General of the Mercator Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change based in Berlin. And um, yeah, I will um, now introduce uh, the speakers that we have. First of all, we will have uh, Stefanie Hiesinger. We are very happy to have her from the European Commission. She is member of the cabinet of the executive vice president for the EU Green Deal. It's the climate uh, czar, you could say, from Franz Timmermans. Um, and she will introduce the Green Deal to us, um, uh, sorry, the, the Fit for 55 package to us and all its facets in, in about 20 minutes. And after that, we will have three commentators. Um, we will have Peter Liese, he's a member of the European Parliament and he's environmental spokesperson of the largest uh, political group in the European Parliament, uh, the Christian Democrats. Then we will have Artur runge um, Until the beginning of his, this year, he was director for climate strategy um, at the European Commission at uh, DG Climate Action. And um, then we will have um, Ottmar Edenhofer. He is economist and director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research and of the MCC as well. And after these comments, we will have uh, hopefully a lively discussion and you can then also use the uh, Q&A um, um, that you see in your um, Zoom link here below. And I will try to, to catch up with that, uh, we will see, but um, yeah, uh, we will also have some, some deep types and some of the critical issues. And with that, I'd like to hand over to, to Stefanie Hiesinger to present us here the, the whole package. Thank you very much, Stefanie. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the invitation uh, um, only two days after we actually presented the package. So to give you a bit of a, an overview uh, yeah, of this fresh from the press, uh, um, yeah, very comprehensive package. I didn't count the pages, but I was told that it's more than 3000 pages. So that may well be the case. So um, I will try to to limit uh, myself to the essentials. So don't, uh, um, yeah, don't uh, fear that I will now start to go into all the details. Uh, I think I leave that for your summer reading. But I want to present to you the main elements of this package that are also outlined here. Um, you can see it, it is quite comprehensive. It is uh, covering quite many different areas. At the same time, um, it is something that builds on our existing framework. Um, and I will um, talk to that a little, bit, a little bit later as well. So to start, I think we need to take a step back and remind ourselves why we're doing this. So we're doing this in, because we now have a European climate law in place that for the EU as a whole prescribes a climate neutrality target by 2050 and then also an increased 2030 target of at least minus 55% of net emission reductions by 2030. I think that's really important to keep that in the back of our head for the discussion that we are now 
entering um, together with the Council and the European Parliament on uh, the legislative files of this package because we need to always keep in the back of our head that there is a legally binding target that we need to reach and that we cannot afford uh, not to uh, not to reach and not only because it's a legally binding target but also because we need to prevent climate change from happening as we can see in many parts of the world and in Europe uh, these days. So we also not only go back to the, to the climate law, we also have um, already quite some comprehensive analysis available in what we call the 2030 climate target plan that already outlined, outlined in quite some detail that this new target is actually feasible, but also beneficial. And what we're doing here with this package is actually going a step further as we now show what it takes to really implement that higher target. And uh, yeah, as you can see, there are many uh, different pieces of legislation that will have to be adjusted. But again, we are not starting from scratch. We start from our current framework. We never called it a fit for, 50, uh, fit for 40 package, but it was actually uh, a fit for 40 package because it would have delivered the minus 40% reduction by 2030 that we had um, agreed upon in 2014 already, or leaders had agreed upon in 2014. So these are the tools that uh, make us reach minus 40 already. And what we now do basically, and, I, and you will tell me, but this is much shorter or smaller than what you showed us before, but in principle, we press fast forward on the targets and actions that are enshrined in that legislation, and we add a few other instruments to it. But these are the main building blocks that will uh, also now lead the way towards minus 55. Here you can see the different measures, and I will talk in the details uh, about some of the measures that we, that we now adjust in this package. So as a cornerstone of our um, climate policy, the EU emissions trading system, that is the new emissions trading system in principle for the power sector and industry. What we will do is we will strengthen that system further. We will lower the cap of that system that should deliver a stronger price signal. We will also extend that system to maritime emissions and then for aviation, the system already covers aviation, but for aviation, we will phase out the free allowances to the sector and we will implement the international uh, carbon offsetting uh, scheme from ICAO, so CORSIA, that will be implemented as well through the ETS, um, so that also flights, um, international flight or European airlines will have to offset their emissions from international flights. Uh, in the future. We also have the effort sharing regulation. There uh, we keep the current scope of the regulation and that is in particular important when I later on explain to you the extension of the ETS to other sectors. Um, we will adjust the scope only for maritime um, and then we also still need national policies um, as we do now with those targets. So the targets that we are setting and we will increase the national targets. They increase on average by around 10 percentage points. And we and those targets should deliver the necessary accountability also by member states to delivering the overall target. And finally, we have uh, upgraded the land use, land, use, land use change and forestry regulation because we know that we need to enhance the carbon sink, uh, the capacity of our land and forests to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. We also need that sector to, um, in the fight against biodiversity loss. And then there is a basically three-step approach that we adopt in this uh, regulation now. So first, until 2025, there will not be so many changes uh, in the regulation. But for the period 2026 to 2030, we will set an EU-wide uh, removals target of 310 million tons, which will be or which is broken down in national 
targets. So each and every member state will have a target uh, on how the carbon sink uh, in that country will have to develop. And then as a third step for the period after 2031, we will combine the land use sector and forestry sector as we currently know it with the non-CO2 agriculture emissions that are currently covered by the effort sharing regulation. And for that sector, we uh, will reach or we have a target of reaching climate neutrality by 2035 set in that regulation. Um, for reasons of clarity, just to say there, there are often two misunderstandings. That is an EU climate neutrality target. So that doesn't mean that at member state level, uh, that sector has to become climate neutral, but for the EU as a whole. And it also doesn't mean that the agricultural sector has to be climate neutral by that time. It's actually through the combination of the land use sector and the agricultural sector that we will uh, reach climate neutrality. And then finally, I've already hinted to that. So the emissions uh, trading system is also extended for road transport uh, to, to road transport and buildings emissions. And that um, I will show you a bit more in detail because it's one of the, the uh, novelties and also quite controversially discussed issues um, among experts. But um, we will. We have decided that we will extend the emissions trade, uh, not extend the emissions trading. We will actually create a new emissions trading system uh, for road transport and buildings, um, and that uh, we do as follows. So for buildings, we have the heating installations, and I will show you it all because that's easier to explain. So first of all, to note that for the building sector, part of it is already under the EU emissions trading system, namely the power sector and the electricity that we all use at home is already subject to the carbon price signal of the ETS. And now what we add is actually the heating fuels um, for which the fuel supplier will have to surrender ETS allowances and, uh, um, and will have to cover the emissions from, from the use of those heating fuels, which means that the fuel supplier has a choice to change its business model and to move to less carbon intensive fuels. And at the same time, we also know they will, um, they will, sorry, there's something wrong. They will also um, pass on the cost to the consumers. And that's why, uh, for that cost pass through, we will also or we create what we call the social climate fund to help those who are most vulnerable to cover the increased costs that the fuel supplier will impose on them. The same actually goes for I'm sorry for the road transport where there is the uh, transport user, so the car owner and the refinery. The refinery will have an incentive or will have to surrender the um, allowances for the emissions from the use of the road transport fuels. They are likely to pass on those costs to the consumer. And again, the social climate fund will be there to help the most vulnerable transport users. And that is also co-financed by the EU budget. So we, we will have what I, um, or we will have what we call an upstream system. It's not the household uh, or the car owner that will be subject to the system, but it is going to be the fuel supplier. For those living in Germany, that is already a well-known system where it's also the fuel supplier who is subject to the national emissions trading system. The main question that is always asked is why we are doing it? Well. We do it because on the one hand, the ETS is delivering. The ETS has really delivered in the power sector and in industry tangible emission reductions. And we see that the current policies in road transport and buildings is actually not delivering because we see that the emissions increase. And here we have a cost-effective instrument that guarantees us the emission reductions. And that's why we feel we should use that instrument as a tool 
and as a tool in particular for member states, because I said the scope of the effort sharing regulation will remain the same. So the emissions will still be covered by the national targets of the member states, but they will get an additional tool to meet those targets. Well, we also know, of course, um, that the carbon price as such is not sufficient and that we also need regulations. The CO2 standards for cars is uh, an example of that. And we will also strengthen those standards as part of this package. But at the same time, we also know that those standards are not sufficient because they fulfill a completely different purpose. Those standards are delivering tangible results and emission reductions right now, but they do this for the new car fleet. While we know that it's all nice and fine to uh, decarbonize that fleet, but at the same time, we need, we will still see um, cars with internal combustion engines drive around our streets for the next 10 years or even longer. And that's why we still need to also decarbonize the fuels and have the ETS uh, for those sectors in parallel. And finally, I think there's also this issue that we want this transition to be fair. We want it to be just a just transition. Uh, Mr. Timmermans also always says, well, this transition will be just or it will just not be. And that's a strong conviction he has because we need to take along everybody. But this carbon pricing tool for those sectors allows us actually to make it fair because an ETS creates revenue and it creates revenue that can either be distributed uh, between member states, but it can also uh, lead to redistribution within member states. That's why we have created in those proposals a social climate fund that will use 25% of the revenues uh, from the, this new ETS. It will be co-financed or the, the, the support from that fund will be co-financed by the member states and it will be used to mitigate the cost for, the most, uh, for those who are most exposed to the price increases that I described. There will be around 72.2 billion euros available for the seven year period from 2025 to 2032. 2025 is an important date in that respect because the new ETS will only start in 2026. But here the, the fund will start operating before it will already have um, money available so that there can already be support and investments that then mitigate also the uh, cost increase. Um, well, as I said, the income will allow to help those who are more vulnerable and that overall creates uh, a fairer society. Um, maybe just to complement then on the rest of the measures of the package and I come back also to, uh, to the social fairness point later on uh, in um, one more time. So on the other measures that we take, we also revamped the renewable, renewable energy directive. We increased the target to 40% for renewables from the current 32. That will be a binding target on EU level and we strengthen in that uh, directive the safeguards for sustainable bioenergy from forest biomass and remove other barriers to the deployment of renewable energy. Then on the energy efficiency directive, we also increase the target to uh, 36, uh, respectively 39%, depending on, on whether you look at the primary energy consumption or the final energy consumption from the current 32.5%. And that is also binding at the EU level. And then there are further measures in that directive for key sectors, such as, for example, um, a 3% renovation um, obligation for public buildings. Then I already mentioned the CO2 emission standards for cars and vans. So there as well, and that has, uh, I think, uh, been discussed most uh, in at least the German press, as far as I have seen. Um, so there we will also uh, yeah, tighten the standards and, uh, and arrive at zero emissions by 2035. 
And then further parts of the package um, are related to alternative fuels. So there is for the aviation sector, uh, the refuel aviation initiative that obliges uh, to blend um, the fuel mix for aviation with uh, alternative fuels um, and in increasing percentages. For the fuel EU maritime, there as well, we want to strengthen the uptake and the supply of uh, alternative fuels in the sector so that there will be uh, a carbon intensi intensity standard for, for the fuel used on board of ships. And then the alternative fuel infrastructure directive, which is actually, that's a mistake because it won't be a directive any longer. It will now be a regulation, so it will be, it's the alternative fuels infrastructure regulation that will then um, ensure that there is the, the corresponding deployment of infrastructure for, for charging of electric vehicles and others. Then we have a, a revision of the energy taxation directive in this package that ensures that we align the tax, tax rates uh, with the Green Deal objectives and we remove certain exemptions that uh, incentivize fossil fuel use still in aviation and maritime and also promote sustainable fuels via, via that uh, taxation directive. Then there's a much debated instrument, which is the carbon border adjustment mechanism. That is a mechanism that um, well addresses the risk of carbon leakage. The, we will put a carbon price on imported goods uh, in selected sectors, and that ensures that the, our ambitious climate action is not undermined by the fact that others do not move at the same pace and therefore emissions are relocated or um, we import products uh, that have a higher carbon footprint. So this is again the overall picture and I wanted to just uh, to come before I come to the end point out one more point. I said several times this is one comprehensive package and and what we find important to stress is that all of these building blocks lead us to the binding target of minus 55% emission reductions by um, 2030. If you take out one piece of that puzzle because you don't like it, you cannot not replace it. You need to replace it by something else. So you either have to, uh, yeah, find that alternative or we just won't reach the target. But when you look for alternatives, and in particular, um, an example is, is the emissions trading for road transport and buildings, where many people um, or many stakeholders tell us that they are critical towards it. But when you take that out of this equation, you have to give us an alternative. And the alternative can, in principle, only be more regulation and more taxation. And that's where, uh, I would like to stress that that also has a cost because it's often argued that, that emissions trading has a cost. That's true. It has a cost. The cost will be passed on to the consumer, but regulation also has a cost. And our impact assessment even shows that overall for society, the cost of that regulation is higher and that we would, would actually need to, you know, have higher costs, but no means to redistribute the effort amongst society, which the emissions trading, as I explained, allows. Uh, to give you all, an example as well, is so if, if we don't do this emissions trading for buildings, for example, and a possible alternative is then that uh, we strengthen the either the energy efficiency directive or uh, a piece of legislation that will only be presented a bit later, which is the energy, uh, uh, the performance, the energy performance in buildings directive. Sorry, and then you can obviously ban gas boilers, but that also has a cost in particular for the most vulnerable. And but you wouldn't have any funds to support such a measure. So that's why again you need to see this as a comprehensive package. You we can. Well, we are open to discuss all the different issues, but uh, when you don't like one piece, you need to present an alternative. And, and that is, 
I think, what we will strongly defend in the future when we then discuss with Council and Parliament. So thanks again for uh, the opportunity to present that package to you. I will leave it at, at this now and then I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much to uh, Stephanie Hiesinger for this um, great presentation to summarize the 3000 pages in uh, just 15 to 20 minutes. Um, I think it was a very comprehensive uh, summary and we already have a lot of questions in the chat, mainly about uh, the ETS and the new ETS. Um, we will later take on uh, some of these questions. Probably we cannot answer all of them, but we will try to, to take some of them um, on the agenda. Now we want to continue with uh, three comments that we have. And the first one is uh, Peter Liese, um, Member of Parliament, to comment on this package. Welcome, Mr. Liese. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. And before I react on the concrete proposals of the Commission, I cannot but uh, tell you what's just happening in Germany. And as you know, also in parts of the Benelux, east of Belgium, parts of the Netherlands, including the, the town where Franz Timmermann lives, we see a dramatic catastrophe, a flooding that has never, never, ever appeared in this part of Europe. In my constituency, uh, which is South Westphalia, already on, on Wednesday evening, people died. But now I got more and more information, really, really shocking information. My, my future wife is working in Cologne, and the area close to Cologne is now dramatically affected. She told me that there are people, death people in the trees, because the flood was so strong that uh, there was an enormous river which, which destroyed everything. And when the water is going down now, you see dozens of people died, and some of them even in the, in the trees. So we will expect several hundreds of people dying in the east of Belgium, in parts of the Netherlands and, and the western part of Germany. And when we listen to the scientists, the meteorologists, um, you know, most of them say this would not happen 50 years ago. This is already a clear indication of climate change. And at least there is a consensus that these kind of events will be much more frequently when we don't address uh, the climate change. So really, this is changing the debate. I'm, I'm sure it will dramatically change the debate. But of course, before we come to the, the future mitigation, we need to act now, we need to help. And also the European Union must help. I already addressed Ursula von der Leyen that the European Solidarity Fund must be activated for the, for the affected regions. That's that's very, very clear. That is the biggest catastrophe that this part of Europe ever um, suffered since the Second World War. And I'm sure that in the parts of Europe where this happens, it will also directly influence the discussion on the Fit for 55 package because nobody can afford to be unambitious when it comes to climate change. And that's why we need to be ambitious at the same time, we need to be efficient. So everything what we do needs to reduce as much CO2 as possible. And uh, personally, I think the commission has made quite a good proposal. So we need to look at it, we need to discuss it. So I'm sure we will also make amendments in, in different ways. But I think the, the huge criticism that is coming from two sides, those that say it's all too ambitious and not uh, possible. And fortunately, the, the minor part that say it's not ambitious at all, um, you know, they, they should make proposals how to make it better. I think it's really good that finally the commission addresses the maritime sector. It is completely unacceptable that this, this part of the economy was not subject to any European legislation until now. It's high time. Um, as Ursula von der Leyen said, cruise ships emit, one cruise ship emits like 80,000 cars. And people are waiting for efforts here. Shipping industry must do an effort. 
personally, I'm very, very happy that finally the aviation sector will go to 100% um, auctioning in the ETS, and that's only two examples. Um, for my group, for my EPP group, three elements of the proposal are of particular importance. And my assessment is that the commission really uh, looked at the EPP priorities and reflects them in the proposal. Uh, we wanted to have a bigger focus on things. Uh, the Lulu CF sector was not obliged to contribute anything to the ambition. It was only a, a, a zero target. Now we have a proposal that increases the things and this could, if implemented, bring us to not only 55%, but 57%. It's important to communicate that in the right way to farmers and forest owners. It should not be seen as intervening in their properties, but giving them the right incentives. But you have some good ideas. The common agriculture policy can help, but also the uh, private money can help with the carbon crediting scheme. So I think it's a good base for the negotiation. On industry, we very much uh, insist that we should decarbonize industry and not deindustrialize Europe. The proposal is very challenging for the industry, but it also takes into account that there's international competition. What I like very much, and I, my colleagues, as far as I could talk to them, also support this very much, that the commission would also give free allowances for carbon-free industry. So when a steel plant is decarbonized, they will still get free allowances because they are producing steel. And in the current legislation, the moment you don't pollute, you cannot benefit from free allowances. And that will not trigger innovation. If, if you change it like the commission has proposed, so you can continue to get five years free allowances when you decarbonize your whole production. This is a, a trigger for innovation that will create a lot of cash flow for those companies that are the front runners. And that's what we should do. Uh, my main message today is everybody speaks about regulation. Everybody speaks about the burden. And it's clear that without regulation, and without um, cost, we will not make it, but we have to make it. I fully agree with Ursula von der Leyen and Franz Timmermans. But, you know, the money doesn't disappear. We have a lot of incentives in the package. And we have, we have a lot of rules that makes it more profitable to go for the right choices. If you go by railway today, you pay 100% of the cost of the ETS because the rail runs by electricity. If you go by aviation, you pay only 15%. So people that decide to go by rail, travel companies that organize a trip by rail, they pay more for the European ETS than if they do it by, by aviation. That should change. People that use the railway should get, get an incentive and part of the money that we earn with the auctioning in aviation should go to railway and buses to environmental mode of, tran con uh, of um, transport. Industry that decarbonize will be supported. The idea of carbon contract for difference is in the new ETS proposal, um, no, in, the, in the review proposal for the existing ETS, and that's important. And the core of this, of this thinking, give money, make it profitable for people that invest in the right things is the new ETS. I'm very grateful to Stefanie Hiesinger and uh, the whole commission that they finally proposed it. I'm very grateful to Professor Edenhofer that he again and again insisted with the commission, with national governments to really push for it. It's the right thing to do. The opposition comes from the usual suspects, from the far right, ID group in the parliament, Polish government, that's clear, but I'm really shocked. I'm sincerely disappointed that the opposition also comes from the Greens 
and from the Social Democrats in the European Parliament. This is really disappointing. You know, all my life I heard in climate policy without the price for CO2 will not make it. Finally, the Commission makes a proposal and um, yeah, now they criticize. I, I'm really shocked. And what are the alternatives? Of course, they exist. You can go for banning combustion heating system, but to really make it for the ambitious target, it shouldn't be only new heating system. You should go to the people, tell the low income families that live in a, in a house in Poland, next year, you will change your heating system. You are no longer allowed to use the combustion heating system. You need to go for electric for heat pump. I don't think we can do it. I don't think we can do it. And we also cannot regulate when people uh, have a private car and tell them next year, or at least in 35, you please sell your combustion engine and go for electrical, even though you may not have the money. There is a cost. Stephanie Hiesinger is completely right. There's of course another alternative that is promoted somehow by the Greens. They are sometimes not sure what they really want, but some of them say, let's do it by national measures. But national measures increase the cost because of distortion of competition and they lower the ambition. You know, every member state that will induce a carbon price at national level, we say, oh, our neighbors don't have it. You cannot go so high. Um, it lowers the ambition to be not European. And of course, the problems exist. No, nobody should deny the social aspect, but it exists already because uh, uh, energy is quite expensive in Europe. And the power sector is included in the ETS for years. And the price of electricity has increased over the last three years dramatically because of the ETS. I never heard a Green or a Social Democrat saying, oh, we need to stop the ETS in the carbon sector, in the, in the power sector, because average family cannot afford. The first time we have now a tool to help this fund. And it's, it's really important to make it socially fair, also fair among the member states. And let's talk about how we do it, but not block this very important idea. And Mr. also, Hizel, uh, perhaps yes? you can briefly come to an end so that anyhow, other... anyhow it's my last sentence now. Uh, so um, we also need to talk about the rest. So when 25% come into the, the fund, the rest of the money should also be used to enable citizens to cope with the challenge. We all have to act, politicians, economy, but also every individual person. So to say, we cannot do it because some people cannot afford is just not the answer. We need to enable them. We need to stop climate change and that will not happen if we always say it is impossible. We need to make it possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you also for your very um, dramatic description of, of the flood we are facing here, Belgium, Germany, the Netherlands that, that you have mentioned. Um, yeah, it, it shows how important this uh, whole package is. We will continue with uh, two further comments. So by Arthur Rungemetzka now, um, he was with the commission. He is an expert um, also on, on agriculture negative emissions and has a back background in uh, natural resource economics. And so I'm looking forward to hear your thoughts on the package. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me. Um, Kind of when I left the Commission only a few months ago, um, in my final words, I said, please prepare a bold proposal, because that is necessary if you really want to get to minus 55%. And I think my plea has been heard, uh, because what is on the table is a very bold proposal. Uh, and I see even one of my former colleagues, Justus Wessler, in the commentary he's saying, are you not creating a bureaucratic monster, what is here? Um, and I think the response to this is, uh, we need to have a comprehensive response. And at, of course, if you talk about 3000 pages of legislation, uh, this might look like a bureaucratic monster. Uh, but I think when we have the time 
uh, and the leisure to look at it in its detail, we will see it is a very clever uh, project that has been put forward. And uh, Peter Liese has already um, highlighted quite a number of the things that are new in the package and which I believe and I'm convinced are absolutely necessary. Um, and it is, and I want to start with that, uh, really to look at these social aspects. Uh, because I think that is something uh, that has been discussed for a very long time. Uh, we all know there is winners and there is losers and there is some who can cope better and others can cope less. And the fabric of the European Union is that we want to help each other. Um, there's a clear uh, policy that is there for a long time to make sure that everybody can contribute, everybody can participate. And I'm quite pleased that this, uh, these instruments, uh, particularly the, the social fund that has been added, is now an integral part of climate policies. Because thinking climate policy only from the point of economic efficiency is not going to work. Um, we also need to have the social justice uh, that is required and to enable those households in Europe who also wish to um, fight climate change to help them to do this. Um, and I think the thoughts that have been put on paper on how to do this with the new fund, I think they are very welcome. And I think there will be a deep discussion in the European Parliament and also by member states. Secondly, um, there is the issue of subsidiarity. Uh, and I think also that this package is addressing that um, in a very clever manner. So it's not all responsibility put at the EU level, but also member states will still have to play a major role. Um, and that is also true when it comes to transport and the housing sector, because if member states don't take actions in those areas, that means supporting the renovation wave um, and also supporting the transformation, the buying of the new cars, the cleaner cars, um, then of course the um, emissions trading on uh, housing and transport will become extremely expensive. So I think there's also a responsibility here for member states to come in with complementing policies. The final point I want to make is uh, the one which Peter Liese was mentioning at the first and Brigitte, you were uh, referring that I'm an agriculture economist. I think to integrate um, agriculture and land use in the way it has been done is going to be very important. And of those people who know the technicalities of the land use sector and the agriculture sector for a long time, we all know that um, it has been an afterthought um, in the Kyoto Protocol and the international negotiations. So it has always been an afterthought um, also in European policymaking. Uh, and to make sure that um, the agriculture ministers and the ministers responsible for forestry will take a more active role in this and see the opportunities as well, because it's not only about the emissions in agriculture and reducing them and trying to get them as low as possible in the coming decades, but the sector can also contribute to the solutions. And one of those is the removals of carbon from the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, uh, which agriculture can do and which can be strengthened. Uh, and I see here many complementarities also to the recently decided common agriculture policy. Uh, the eco schemes that have been um, adopted now as a new feature, um, I think that is something that should be taken up in the context to really incentivize the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. There's a lot that has to be done in the coming years. And the third area definitely for agriculture and forestry is the whole issue of substitution. Um, and the fuels was mentioned, advanced biofuels can play an important role in that area and different pieces of legislation are going to incentivize that. And the same is true for the substitution of materials. Um, I think today still about 10% of the oil that is used in Europe is used in the chemical industry. 
And that carbon that comes from that oil will have to re be replaced by carbon from somewhere else. And I think agriculture can play an eminent role here. And the new package is really preparing the ground for this and telling uh, the agriculture and the forestry sector, look, apart from the challenges that we're going to see, there's also new business opportunities. So please take it forward in a positive manner. Final, final point is, um, of course, the um, actors in the economy, whether it is individual households, whether it is companies, um, they all want to have predictability. Um, and 3,000 pages is not something that is being negotiated easily. Um, and then there is a need to hurry up. Um, and I think the good thing here is that the new package doesn't deviate too much in terms of its structure from the old package that was negotiated for four years during the Juncker Commission, but it builds on it. And I know that there's many in the parliament who have been working very hard on the previous package. I think you're all prepared, and that's also true for member states, to make progress swiftly uh, over the coming months. The earlier the package is decided, um, the more certainty, the more predictability there will be for economic decision makers in the coming year. So don't um, kind of go on holidays and think there's a long time until the end um, of this um, period of the European Parliament. Um, please kind of be fast um, um, in the coming, coming years. Fast forward, I think this is what Stephanie said. Uh, and I think that also is true for Parliament and Council. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Also for pointing out the urgency again in, in terms of policy um, processes that lie ahead of us. Um, the last comment will come from Professor Ottmar Edenhofer, um, Director of uh, PIC and MCC, and also a long-standing uh, proponent of carbon pricing and especially the ETS. So Ottmar, the floor is yours. Yeah, Brigitte, thanks a lot. And thank you very much uh, to Stefanie Hiesinger for this uh, comprehensive presentation. Now, uh, let me start to remind us what's happening in Germany, in the Netherlands, in, in Belgium. It's, uh, I couldn't agree more with Peter Lise, it's really a catastrophe and uh, people are dying there. And let me express my solidarity with all the families and the people who are suffering. So, to a certain extent, it is quite clear that increasing global mean temperature increases the risk of extreme weather events. There is no doubt about this. You cannot assign a single event to climate change, but with increasing global mean temperature, increasing the risk of floods and droughts. Over the last 10 years, we have been trained to think that the impacts of climate change will happen in the distant future and in the southern part of our globe. Now, we realize now that a catastrophe is happening now in the heartland of Europe, in, in, in Germany, Netherlands and Belgium. And I think it's not true that fighting against climate change is just to take the responsibility for the future generations, just to take the responsibility uh, for people in the Southern Hemisphere. It's also taking seriously the responsibility uh, for the current generation. I think I would like to remind us and, and, and climate change and the damages of climate change is not just a nitty gritty part. It's on the one hand, people are suffering and dying because of that. And in the future, it's also a huge risk of our security and it's a huge risk of our economic development. So in that sense, I think this reminds us uh, on the enormous responsibility we have. Now, let me highlight the importance of the, of the package of the European Green Deal. Minus 55% carbon neutrality by the mid of the century is a very ambitious goal. And I would like to congratulate the commission that they have highlighted this. But even if this would just be an ambitious target, I would not congratulate you because we have heard over the last decade, many politicians announcing targets, missing the targets, formulating new targets. The real interesting thing of this Green Deal is now 
it's about targets, but it is at the same time about an architecture which 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 allows us to achieve this target. Of course, there will be trial and error, there will be uh, mistakes, but by and large, it is a comprehensive and a convincing package. Now, I think it is convincing because it, it puts carbon pricing at the core. And then you might think, okay, this is what economists told us all the time. Economists like uh, carbon pricing and therefore again and again, they repeat the same thing. Carbon pricing is a nice thing. But here I would like to argue carbon pricing is not a nice thing. It is effective, it is efficient, and it allows a just and a fair transition. And let me highlight this. As Stefana Hiesinger has convincingly argued that performance standards and bans did not allow us to reduce the emissions. It was not effective enough. And therefore we need an effective tool. And we know that carbon pricing can be effective in the sense that it enables us to reduce emissions. The second thing is carbon pricing generates the revenues, uh, which allows us to compensate the potential losers. This is important. We should not underestimate the enormous importance of distributional justice and fairness, but carbon pricing generates the revenues which allows us to do this. The last thing is about efficiency. Many people think efficiency is a, an issue of second order. However, in contrast to this position, I would like to argue efficiency becomes even more important when the targets are ambitious because we can only convince people uh, that uh, to join uh, this transformation process when they uh, see that really we do not waste resources. So carbon pricing is effective, it is just and fair, and it can be designed in an efficient way. Now, what happened is that we have now two emission trading schemes. As an economist, you might say, why two emission trading schemes? Why not one? And the reason is a very simple one. We have two because the abatement costs uh, in the emissions trading for uh, uh, the power sector and industry are much lower than for road transport and building. If we put this in one system together, this would lead to emission reduction in the, ET, in the current ETS around 80% and uh, uh, in the other system uh, around uh, 20%. This is something which wouldn't be acceptable for the industry, which wouldn't be acceptable uh, for politicians. The reason why we have basically two ETS systems for a while with two different price trajectories is simply due to the fact to make the whole thing uh, acceptable and to, 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 to launch a, a relatively smooth transition. Therefore, it is important that we, from the very beginning on, we think convincingly in a way how to integrate both systems over time. This should not happen immediately, but it should happen over time. Another and an, uh, uh, an additional aspect which I find in the package uh, quite convincing is the nice relationship between the second ETS and the effort sharing regulation. So the effort sharing, some people believe that the effort sharing regulation is the only way to go. They think the effort sharing regulation is a sufficient and a, 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 a quite comprehensive compliance mechanism. So member states will implement on a national scale their policies, the policies will deliver, this will lead to the emission reduction. Many people, and I'm, I'm, I'm in that camp, have doubts that the effort sharing regulation is a sufficient compliance mechanism. But the nice thing is, uh, because we have now the second ETS, when the effort sharing regulation will not deliver, then, the ETS too can deliver. The more the uh, effort sharing regulation can work, the lower is the price in the second ETS. And then it's a kind of a bad who is right, who believes in the ESR or who thinks that the second ETS is a more convincing compliance mechanism. In the end, the ETS too is, is, is an institutional setting which allows us to achieve that goal. I think uh, therefore this is a, a nice structure. It is not from an efficiency point of view perfect, but it can be made perfect over time. And I think it sends a very strong pricing signal. The last uh, comment I would like to make is um, the CBAM issue. To be honest, I find the CBAM uh, approach 
uh, the less convincing part of, of this package. I believe that the CBEM might be uh, uh, necessary, but uh, I think, and I would propose the commission is very well advised uh, to enhance and to invest its political capital uh, to bring China and to bring US on board and probably a climate club could then implement such a CBEM mechanism. I know this is uh, a, a quite uh, a daunting task and uh, requires a lot of political capital, but from my point of view, this is the right perspective uh, to proceed. There are many other things like uh, the energy taxes and so on, uh, but uh, for the time being, I would like to conclude. And uh, I conclude uh, that this package, if it in the end, it will be decided, it will be a historic breakthrough. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Otmar. Um, so now we have the chance to um, discuss everything we have heard and we have already got uh, nearly 90, uh, 40 questions in the Q&A chat question. I hope that all the panelists already had a chance to briefly look at that. Um, first, the abbreviation CBAM is carbon border adjustment mechanism. So for, for our um, viewers, I don't know if everybody is an expert in all these acronyms uh, that have been created. Um, Perhaps um, I would like to start, um, there are many questions around the second ETS and um, why has this been set up in, in the way it, it is now proposed and which are the extensions and so on. Um, to Stephanie Hiesinger, I don't know whether you can answer all these questions, but I would like to, to ask two questions um, here so that have been already um, mentioned by, by Otmar. So the first one is, um, what is the long-term perspective of the second ETS? Do you think this will be merged? What, what does the commission propose? Then there were several questions in the chat. Um, which kind of carbon price do you expect? Where do you think will the carbon price um, in the second ETS um, be in 2026 20, or also in 2030? Are there any assessments being made? Um, and then we have a whole bunch of questions around the revenues, um, um, how, how the revenues are being used and distributed, um, what is going to the social fund, what is going to the member states and so on. And perhaps you can um, briefly comment on, on this. Thank you. Yeah, um, I also saw that there are quite many questions on, on the new ETS and I think we could do a webinar only on that part of the package actually because it's, uh, it's quite comprehensive. I also realized that there are some features that I didn't mention at all but that would be relevant in relation to what Peter Liese said or also Otmar Ebenhofer there. Um, when it comes, for example, to, to financing innovation, I heard, uh, and there are also quite some some features in it. When the question why do we have two ETS, I think it was partly addressed just now by, by Professor Edenhofer, but there's, apart from the marginal abatement cost um, issue, there's also, of course, uh, the, the issue that it's a bit of a different design that you uh, create an upstream system where the, the ETS for the power sector um, and for industry and as well for maritime, so for maritime, that question was also in the chat, why maritime is not in this separate system, but in the existing system. Well, this is a downstream system where you can, uh, where the point of regulation is different. So you regulate uh, the, the installation operator or the aviation operator or the ship owner, while uh, this new ETS uh, is directed at fuel suppliers. And, and that is a bit of a different design than rather uh, than the existing ETS, but uh, the marginal abatement cost um, is, of course, also one aspect to it. Um, with regard to the price, well, maybe you allow me not to speculate what the price would be, um, but from the very design of the system, um, there it's designed that there is a gradual phase in of this new uh, ETS in the sense that, that, as I said, you know, we also have a support mechanism in place before we actually start the trading so that we can anticipate uh, already um, that introduction and invest or member states can organize investment in the sectors which would ultimately also have then effects on the consumption um, and uh, and um, 
on uh, on the price or the cost that the consumer would uh, need to bear. Um, then we will also um, start the system with um, increased auction volumes. So if you look at the text, we will in the first year um, auction 30% uh, more volume than the cap. Uh, which will, um, I mean, you are the economist, so I don't need to tell you, but that will, in the, that increased supply will also have an impact on the price. Then the market stability reserve will also operate uh, in this new ETS. It has an initial endowment for the second ETS uh, of 600 million allowances in the reserve and uh, the thresholds um, are set accordingly and the operation of the reserve is organized as in the, in the current ETS. And then as a third issue uh, in the context of, well, not issue, a third feature in the context of crisis, we do have some kind of emergency break, uh, something that we also already know from the existing ETS, uh, the famous or infamous Article 29A, where in the case of excessive price increases or price spikes, we can... Um, uh, or the Commission can inject uh, then uh, allowances into that system. Um, there, there are two stages to that, so depending on, on the order of magnitude of the price increase, uh, either it's it, when it doubles, there's a reaction plan to it, and if it uh, triples as well. So, and these features um, will all lead, to, as we think, to a smooth start of the of the second ETS in terms of uh, prices and market build up. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, if the other panelists want to add something, you can simply raise your hand either physically or virtually. Um, I would like to exactly. I would also like to to ask Peter Lise one one issue because uh, now the revenues um, of this new ETS. Um, a large number of the revenues go into the social funds and a number of revenues is reserved for the member states that they um, should reserve the uh, revenues for, um, for low income households. So where do you see or where will most of the resistance come from? Do the member states agree that the revenues are mainly used by the commission? The same also with the CBAM proposal, the revenues from or the, the, the money from that will stay with the Commission. It's an, an own, own source. So um, what is your perspective? How will the member states react to that proposal? Because normally the member states would, would also like to have the revenues of that. So where do you expect uh, resistance? Yeah, of course, that will be a challenging debate. Um, the first problem has already been solved in my view. I hope Stephanie Hisinger can confirm that because I was not able to digest all the pages, but I had uh, the very clear message from the head of cabinet of Ursula von der Leyen that this money will not be used for next generation EU. That I think is important because we need to make clear that this is not a revenue for the European Union or for the member states, but it's a climate instrument and uh, with, with Manfred Weber, our chair, we, we already published two weeks ago an article where we said it should be a Schwarze Null for the citizens. So the state and the European Commission should give more money to the people than they earn with the system. So it shouldn't be an instrument to generate income for the member states, but it should be a climate instrument. And that means at least the amount of money that is going into the system should be given to the citizens either for enable them to cover with, with the cost or enable them to do their own uh, transition. It will be a hell of a fight because of course the Polish uh, DPR already said me this morning, we like, we like the fund, but we don't like the ETS. So, um, but that's, the challenge you know we need we need to make it and we need to find a good compromise and to be honest we also need to accept that there is a solidarity um, mechanism also between the member states of course bulgaria must get more out of this fund than it, it pays to make them yeah enable their citizens also to to cope with the transition and there is also a link 
with the effort sharing, there is still the effort sharing and in the end, maybe also there needs to be a transition of money um, inside the European Union. Um, one thing is very important uh, coming to the, to the other question, the price. Of course, the price will also depend on the enabling framework. So when we have a, a charging infrastructure, as it is proposed in the European Commission proposal, the price uh, will not go up so much because people have the alternative. That's why I believe in the policy mix. So to enable people also with the legislative framework to, to change their behavior and to buy an electric car and also have the possibility to charge it. So that's why prediction of, of 300 euro, maybe uh, Professor Innofer can comment on it. They are just science fiction. So when we do it right, the price will be much, much lower. And last point, why I support this idea so much, you know, I have plenty of ideas and I know many colleagues that have super ideas how Europe can save CO2. But I don't think that we politicians or people like Stephanie Hiesinger have better ideas than the whole citizens, every company, every citizen should make its individual choices how to save CO2. And when we have an ETS, that will always pay off, even if it doesn't fit in the framework that, that we discuss. So when the technology is different, when the individual choice is different, as, as we may think, but they still save CO2, they will save money. And that's the most important thing, that everybody who saves CO2 must save money. Thank you. Um... Ma, do you want to um, comment on, on the level of the price that is to expect? I think it is uh, a little bit um, um, predicting prices is, is, is always a tough thing. You can either predict the price or the, the point in time when it happened, but you should not do both because uh, you, you will fail. Uh, the, the most important thing seems to me is the following. We, we want to implement an emissions trading scheme because we don't know exactly what our the marginal abatement cost curves. We do not know exactly the technologies. And we want to, to have a, a process, a search process of all the, the people, the citizens, the consumers, the investors to do this. I expect uh, a higher price in, in, in the second ETS because indeed what we know so far is that the marginal abatement cost curves are, 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 are higher than in, in the other sector, but also in the ETS one, we will see uh, an increasing price, uh, I believe, uh, I could imagine by 2030, even 100 euros per ton CO2. This will facilitate uh, and enable and uh, kick off and accelerate uh, the phase out of coal and, and such things. So, but I, I think this is a little bit a little bit speculation. The most important thing is that we have now the the, the, the right targets, and when there are price spikes. Uh, the Commission can uh, can respond to that. To be honest, I'm uh, I'm not uh, a big fan of the market stability reserve. I would like to see much more price corridors, but uh, price corridors are are not not uh, on the table now. It's politically not not realistic, but but it is important that uh, um, and it is not a trivial task in the future to keep the both uh, instruments separate because uh, when people expect that at some stage. Um, the, 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 the both systems will converge, so then people can bank, and then this would lead to increasing prices. So in that sense, if we want to keep both systems and the price development separate uh, uh, for good reasons, so then, then we have to, to, to analyze very, very carefully how the market stability reserve in the second ETS uh, will, will, will work. And I think uh, in the long run, uh, we need an institution which is, is able to manage uh, this transition quite, uh, quite smoothly. So this is, uh, but this is, this is a little bit more for the long-term future. Thank you. Um, some people in the chat are a bit more critical about uh, the effect of the carbon price in the building sector and address the landlord-tenant pro um, problem. And also, I mean, at the EU level, it's it's in the building sector, it's different from, from the transport sector where you have additional measures like um, standards for cars and so on. You have the renovation wave program, but really the landlord tenant pro, um, problem in, in the building sector might be very strong. So um, 
does anybody want to answer that question, how to overcome that problem? Because the price alone will not do the job, probably. I don't know, Stephanie or Arthur. Yeah, Stephanie. If I may, <laughs> sorry. First, perhaps Stephanie Hisinger. Uh, yeah, I mean, from the the system as we have created it, as and, and that's where I said, you know, the, the price increases, of course, indirect because it's the fuel supply, as is the case in Germany as well. But then you need to make, um, yeah, or the price signal needs to go to that person who has actually control over the emissions. And, and that is, on the one hand, of course, also those renting uh, and then... You know, switching on the heating but but that is what i it's an aspect that i actually very much like about the climate social fund because combining direct income support uh, on the one hand and that goes then to the renter who can you know uh, use it to pay the bills and provide money for investments which then go to the landlord because he's the only one who can actually renovate the building and and to have those two options will actually help address that issue of you know the price uh, uh, being passed on for both of them. So the, and that's where I, I think it's, uh, well, it's a nice feature of this fund. Thank you. Mr. Lisa, you also want to comment? Yeah, I think we need to be more creative. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. That's why I'm not sure if it is uh, something that we can regulate at European level or if it needs to be um, done at national level. Um, you know, in Germany, we have this debate who will cover the costs uh, and there's uh, yeah, quite some different opinion in the national parliament. But the, the question is, when we want to enable people to change, the question is not who covers the cost alone, but what are the rights of the tenant? No, first of all, we have already labeling of buildings. So when you go for a new flat, you already know and you should you should calculate with an increased price of gas and oil and hopefully decreasing price of electricity, what will be the, the future cost I have when I rent this flat. But when you still already live in a flat, I think we need to have a framework where tenants can also have um, some, some kind of right of renovation. So when we really want to make this transition, transition, it cannot be that uh, there are 10 people living in different flats in this house and because they cannot agree, there is no renovation. It should be a right to force for renovation, of course, covering the costs, but um, we should this, you know, this problem is so important and our children and grandchildren, they will not understand if we say, okay, there was a legal problem with the tenant and the landlord, and that's why we just didn't do it. We need to solve it. And the right to have a low emitting heating system should be implemented. And then of course, the one that claims it also must to contrib contribute to the cost of the heating system. And uh, he will also have a reduced bill. So we need to change our thinking. We cannot say, oh, the, the tender is not allowed. He cannot impose it. He should be able to impose it when the landlord is just not willing to do it. So that, that there must be innovative instruments and we need time to work on this. But to say the tender is not able to make this decision cannot allow us to not make the transition. Yeah, actually in Germany it was debated whether 50% should be paid by, by the landlord, but it didn't come through, but it will be probably... On this, the is, this is a stupid, simple idea just to say 50-50 of the cost that will not change the heating system when both don't want it. Uh, so what At I mean is something different. It was a different. proposal Sorry. and it had some, some, <laughs> yeah. some rational and it will be probably on the table again. Atto, I saw that uh, you wanted to jump in, but I also have a question for you on agriculture, but you can first go on, on the building sector. I think that uh, this issue, I think we know for a long time in terms of uh, in economics, the principal agent problem that we have. And I think there is solutions to that. And that will have to be additional to uh, the ETS price. Um, and one of those is definitely uh, the support programs uh, that we will see. 
but the other might still be, um, as Mr. Lisa said, uh, the right of um, getting into a renovated building. And I think the energy performance of buildings um, directive is something that could address this issue uh, in a good way. Um, and I think this even goes further because when we look at the buildings, um, it's not only about um, the amount of heating gas, but it's um, the use of energy um, in different ways and also to bring together on one side the heating or the energy that we use for heating, um, the renewable energy that a building can produce because you can put solar panels on top of it and also link it up to mobility. So I think when people talk about deep renovation, uh, that is what is in the end meant. Uh, it's a complete overhaul of our buildings. Um, and that will require action on many fronts. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a follow up question. Um, you already mentioned uh, the importance of agriculture and, and land use. And there is a good question by, by Linda Zudema in, in the chat here. I don't know whether you have seen that. Um, I mean, Stefan Hiesinger um, um, said that this whole package is to um, is, is for the 2030 targets for the minus 55%. But on the other hand, Europe has also a long-term target of greenhouse gas neutrality by 2050. And in that sense, um, because we need net zero, um, so we also need negative emissions. And um, this can be done in a technical way, but, but also more from the land use sector. And perhaps you can answer her question. Um, I hope you have seen it. Um, it's it's about the how to do it because I think not everybody can can see the question. So the question is um, how to achieve this uh, negative emissions in the land use sector. What are the measures, um, price signals, or new targets for removals, um, and so on? Yeah, Arthur. I think uh, Stephanie was explaining uh, a kind of three-step approach that is being taken uh, in LULUCF. So. Uh, that we continue with the current legislation that we have until 2025. Uh, and then we start setting more ambitious targets for the LULUCF sector. So to set the 310 million tons of removals uh, that should be done by 2030. And that is something around 50 to 60 million tons more than what actually is being removed at the present point in time. Uh, and this is being distributed to individual member states. So it's member states who will have to deliver on these targets um, at the national level. Uh, and I think here comes in what I mentioned in terms of the ECHO schemes, uh, that member states can use the policy instruments under the common agriculture policy to provide direct incentives to farmers and foresters who are going to do more in the future uh, on removals. And I think the good thing here is also that um, this is announced fairly early because making changes in the agriculture and the forestry sector, that's not like um, mana falling from heaven from today to tomorrow, uh, but it requires changing land use practices. Uh, it requires maybe planting trees. Um, so it will require time until the removals really be, will become effective. Uh, so there is a long lead time now um, until 2030. And when we look at the climate neutrality target for agriculture in 2035, so it's 15 years ahead where agriculture and forestry ministers can plan for that. Um, I think this is going to be very important in the longer term. Um, I think um, if I would look beyond the year 2035, uh, I could see um, kind of this going directly into an emissions trading system. Um, because look at the year 2050. In the year 2050, we say for Europe, um, all remaining or residual emissions we will have will have to be balanced by removals. Uh, and I think that's the idea the Commission has when coming up with certification of removals. Because when you have these certificates um, in the year 2050, that is the only currency that would count uh, in an EU-wide emissions trading system. And everybody would have to feed on it, not only the agriculture sector, but also industry, the energy sector, or the transport sector, wherever there would be these residual emissions. Uh, and let's not forget to look maybe even beyond 2050, 
uh, where we will have to become net negative. That is what the science is telling us. So the removal story is not going to be over in the year 2050. Um, and that will have to be planned very well in advance um, because of the time lags we have in moving to the change. Um, a final point I want to make on this one is that uh, this will also require a lot of innovation. Uh, and that was also a point Stephanie was mentioning that there needs to be a strong link to innovation. And it's not only through the income or the revenue from uh, the ETS, but it's also through additional regulation. Uh, and I personally have always seen uh, the CO2 standards for cars, for instance, but also now the standards for uh, fuels as a tool to generate innovation um, and to push forward this innovation. And um, a little bit like what was done in the past uh, with wind energy, when kind of it was um, seen by many as a silly idea um, so that had to be pushed um, as an innovation. And you can do that on one side with the research programs, but you can also do that with additional regulation uh, by gradually bringing in these new technologies and providing certainty to those companies who invest in these new technologies to make so that they have a business case for them. And I think that's exactly the same also in agriculture. So also here, we will need to see massive innovation uh, in the coming 10 to 20 years in order to get to climate neutrality in 2050. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, what may you raise your hand? Um, yeah, uh, I, I raised my hand because um, I would like to, uh, to bring one aspect uh, on the table, which, uh, uh, which widens a little bit the, the perspective beyond, uh, beyond Europe. And the starting point could be CBIM, but the, the issue is a, a little bit broader. And let me share with you one, one observation. So if you look at, at the globe, so you see basically just one region where the emissions are declining, and that's Europe. In the United States, the emissions are almost stable. In other parts of the world, emissions are rising. And we have a, a quite li a high likelihood that uh, the emissions will rise again in 2021. And, 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 and therefore, that seems to me is something which, uh, which is important to understand. Uh, when Europe and US and China would find a way to cooperate, for example, on, on a minimum carbon price and then impose a, a CBAM on, on their borders in order to incentivize people to join the club, it would half of the global emissions. And if we would include uh, Japan and uh, Russia, uh, so we would be all, all more already at the, at the two third level. So this is something which is, uh, and India, of course, I forgot India, otherwise you, it, it will, not, will not add up to two thirds. If we want to really to, to, to reduce the risk of extreme weather events and the, the risk of dangerous climate change, we need international cooperation. And I'm really concerned that on the one hand, the CBAM uh, could be perceived as a kind of a, a, a protectionist uh, approach, which is uh, creates a lot of hostility outside of Europe. And the second thing is, I think the carbon pricing scheme is, has, is, is very important because then this could be really used also to negotiate with other parts of the world on on, on, on minimum carbon prices. So we should not forget China has started the national emissions trading scheme. But I think Europe should start to think very clearly how to invest the political capital to enhance international cooperation, because international cooperation is needed if we want to limit the global mean temperature. And this is something which is extremely important. And I don't want to miss the opportunity to bring this uh, on the table here. Thank you. Very important point to, to think across uh, the borders as well. Um, we are coming close to an end and I would like to hand over to Stefanie Hisinger. Um, one of my questions is, I mean, this proposal is two days old, right? But you have probably already experienced um, a lot of criticism. I mean, you have gained a lot of um, um, very positive feedback. Also here in the chat, there has been very positive feedback. 
but probably also some resistance already. And, and can you say which were the most important or the, the most, um, what is the most critical issue? Is it the second emission trading system? Is it the CBAM proposal? Can you already say something on that? Oh, yes, thank you. And if you allow me just one comment on uh, what Otmar Edenhofer just said, because I think uh, we do um, have a very comprehensive and, and far-reaching uh, cooperation and outreach uh, ongoing internationally as well. So uh, that is an avenue that we pursue. And I think this package actually really contributes to that uh, in in all its dimensions, because uh, the world is really carefully looking at what Europe is doing. It's true we are... Uh, responsible for around 8% of uh, emissions, but um, but uh, we are very closely watched. And what we uh, do in Europe, and here we try to deliver, or we will deliver on our pledges, that uh, um, other people um, uh, yeah, should take as an example, and then also go that step further beyond just uh, the announcement of mere targets. Um, as uh, to the other question that you have to remind me of? <laughs> it's the... it, it was about the, the question of the major resistance. Uh, um, which kind, which part of the proposal? From well, you, yeah, you said it, of course. I mean, we have received a lot of positive feedback in the first place. And, and that is, I think, a really good sign because it's an acknowledgement of the ambition that uh, Europe shows. At the same time, we we know that some parts, and we discussed the second ETS. Uh, uh, this is something where, you know, uh, a debate is necessary as well. What we want to achieve, why we want to achieve it. I think it's very important to explain that that it's not about uh, merely increasing prices for the sake of uh, having a high carbon price in a sector. No, it's as I said. It's about uh, making this a fair um, green deal, yeah, a fair climate package, and to make sure that we leave no one behind. And that, that is the, the very gist of, of uh, why we think this policy tool is actually needed. We need a tool that delivers on the climate target and that delivers on the fairness. And But it is one of the issues that needs explanation. I mean, almost uh, all people in the call, I would say, are... Uh, climate or experts on emissions trading at least um, have a good understanding of it, but that is not uh, the case of uh, of the wider public. So that uh, needs explanation, and and that is what we will do in the coming months. I I heard uh, somebody saying, "Don't go on holidays and think uh, you can take your time." I will reveal that I will now go on holidays. I will leave you with reading. Uh, the all the the pages that we have produced, but um, I think nevertheless, when we are back, we will do this explaining. That's our job, and and then we are happy to also discuss, you know, the issues from different angles. As I said, but but the premise is that if you you cannot just simply take out one of the instruments of that equation, you need to replace it by something else. And, and that is the debate that we are willing to have. Thank you very much. So already um, very important final words from your side and communication was also mentioned in one of the questions. Um, and I think it's a very important to communicate this also with the social fund. Um, Peter Lise has also a final word very briefly, please, because we are already over time. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, it was a very important debate and more debate is needed, very clear. I just wanted to comment on the point of Professor Edenhofer on the international dimension. So first of all, it's clear, all those that say China and the US should act and not Europe, they are wrong because our percentage uh, for the emissions is still bigger than our percentage on inhabitants. and. For Germany, this is true in particular, 1% inhabitants, 2% of the emissions. So no German should say the others should start. Um, but Professor Edenhoff is also right. We are the one region that declined emissions. And that's why the criticism that the Fit for 55 is not Paris compatible is not really fair because it would include that all what we have done in the last um, 30 years should should not be 
somehow respected. The key question is, how do we work with the other partners now? I think um, Stephanie Hiesinger's boss did a good job on the proposal with his team, but we need much more emphasis on the international dimension now, much more work. And the CBAM should be an invitation to others. I hope it will be never implemented because others have also a CO2 price. Um, if not, we need to protect our industry, but the target should not for the European Union to, to generate money, but for the world to decarbonize. I thank all of you for this very interesting discussion. And I also thank all the people posing the questions in the chat. I think we um, took on some of them and I really very much hope that this proposal will um, come through and uh, will get some dynamics in the coming month when we discuss it in the different European member states and in different uh, contexts as well. Thank you very much. This was the third uh, CPE um, webinar on climate policy. Thank you very much for joining and see you. Have a good summer. Goodbye. <laughs>